Welcome to my YouTube channel. Assalamu alaikum. Greetings of peace. And so last time I talked about how Muhammad al Shaybani in his Kitab al Asl, which I have over here, Muhammad al Shaybani, how he moved away from basically the local Kufan custom. I mean, Abu Hanifa had already signified a move away from Kufan local custom by, you know, formulating his own universal epistemology. But I think uh, Abu Yusuf kind of solidified it a bit more, and he moved more towards the Ahl al-Hadith, just slightly with some particularization, uh, using, you know, Khabar Wahid, or, uh, you know, uh, Hadith Mashhur, in order to formulate a lot of his opinions. And um, it's well known that Abu Yusuf did the same as well. And it's not that Abu Hanifa didn't know hadith. Uh, he had a different way of grading hadith, I think, slightly, you know, ever so teeny weensy, slightly different than Muhammad Shaybani and Abu Yusuf. And today, what I want to talk about is a uh, interesting passage that's found in Kitab al Asl about what is now called the waqf okay and uh, it's usually translated as endowment i think a probably a better translation would be a non-profit in today's world a waqf was usually something that was established um, someone who donated out of their charity um, and maybe they built a farm and they have a caretaker who's responsible for this farm and all the profit uh, from the crops go to some uh, noble endeavor maybe the profit funds a certain madrasa and gives stipend to the teachers and the students they're able to provide food and housing and that type of thing maybe it goes you know to another cause maybe to veterans, those who affect jihad, or it goes to the murabitun, those who are stationed at the front lines, or you know some some other kind of cause, maybe to uh, establish funding for a library, for instance, al maktaba, or you know so, something of of those sorts. Maybe it's to fund a poet. Uh, or just literature production in, in general and so here Muhammad al-Shaybani he has debates with other Hanafis and so I'm going to read to you some of this this uh, is all my own translation here that I'm going to provide to you today uh, these passages have not been translated before just like the previous one that I did about praying for rain in the other video previous video and so there's a chapter what is permissible regarding endowments of land the hostel the graveyard etc bab ma yajuz min sadaqa al ard al mawqufa wal khan wal maqbara wa ghair dhalik shaybani has a debate with an unknown group of jurists likely other hanafis in, in my opinion regarding their inconsistency in using qiyas and arbitrarily using istihsan when it is unwarranted. And as we talked about in the previous videos, qiyas is a juristic analogical reasoning and istihsan is juristic discretion or you might say common sense. So introducing the topic, Shaybani says, if a man makes his land an endowment for the mendicant and poor while the land is clearly demarcated and partitioned and he gave it to a caretaker like a wali or wal other than himself to manage it and he transfers the property from himself to the caretaker to manage it and 
spend on it what it needs in repairs and maintenance of its rivers, wells, and ravines of water. And if it needs to be farmed agriculturally, he will pay for it from the profit, ghalla, what it needs from labor, hired workers, or caretakers who are taking care of it, the land endowment. Then he looks at what remains from the profit of every year and divides it between the mendicant and the poor. So thus, this is an accepted form of charity, sodaqa. That's why it's called al-waqf al-mawqufa. So if a man were to do this in sound health or mind, then he should not repossess anything, yarji or fishayt, from this endowment. End quote. Thereafter, Shaybani speaks on different types of land endowments, such as graveyards, hostels for wayfar wayfarers, marata tariq, and watering holes, saqaya. Shaybani then goes on to say, Abu Hanifa, may God's mercy be upon him, and most of the Hanafis, Amma Ashabina, said, If all of this is returned, mardud, if its owner wishes to repossess it, while all that has been made in it, the land endowment, from endowment, sadaqa for the graveyard, hostel, and watering hole is abolished, and what returns to his wealth and possession, and that returns to his wealth and possession, then he can sell it and gift it and make from it what he wills, and if he dies, then it becomes inheritable. Shaybani then says, We said to them, Why say this, when indeed there came reports, athar, and the Muslims did it and made it permissible? They said, Because the essence, also, of the land is that it does not leave to an owner who owns it other than the person it was for. So how is a land that is owned by a man where anything that emerges out of his wealth does not have an owner over it? It does not transfer from his possession to another other than him. Inform us about the essence of the land. Does it leave from his possession to another's other than him? We said to them, it does not transfer from the possession of one person to the possession of another, but it transfers from his possession to to the command of God, which is where he placed it. The land does not become in the ownership of another, but its utility, menfa, becomes for other than him, other than the owner. Shaybani then goes on to say, We said to them, meaning the other Hanafis, You are saying like this, not finding a logical way out, bad. Tell us about a man who makes his land into a mosque and builds on it like a mosque is built and makes it for the laity of Muslims, gives permission to the people to pray inside that mosque, therefore giving permission for the caller of prayer, and there is an imam leading inside of it. He put it out into a khrajahu, the greatest service, and set it aside from his wealth. The Muslims are praying inside it. It remains like that for a long time. Then it becomes more profitable, Raddu. After that, to demolish it and enter it into his possession and sell it. Is that permissible for him? They said, no. It was said to them, so tell us about a mosque's land and its construction which he made to leave from his possession, or it was in his possession upon its state, halihi. They said if it was in his possession, then it was for him to sell it and gift it, and if he died, then it would be an inheritance. But if it did leave from his possession, so it is not permissible for him to gift or sell or bequeath. It was said to them, so when was it made to leave his possession? Did it enter the possession of another? They said no. We said to them, likewise the endowment, the hostel, and the graveyard, 
that left from his possession and became ungiftable, unsellable, and uninheritable, and he does not transfer his property to another. So tell us, how do you differentiate between the mosque and these things that we have described to you? All of that is for God the exalted and sought after by whoever is there with it. Do you hold the opinion that if a man says, I allow the hostile and the profitable mosque, so I place it as an inheritance? And he says, Verily, I allow the graveyard to be repossessed because it is not, because in the disentombment of graves and removing the dead, is there, in removing the dead, there is a great taboo. So it should not be the case that graveyards is sold, gifted, or inherited from. Because that which becomes his does not prevent disentombing of the graves and removing the dead from it. If it is more profitable to place it as a land where rivers are dug from it and it cultivates date palms and trees, or maybe that's irrigations, there is a transgression and harm, barar, so he should not repossess the graveyard. As for the mosque, there is no harm, barar, in it. People will pray in other than it wherever they want from the mosques. Which thing were we debating about? What thing were we challenging? Which had increased adjudicating like you have adjudicated? What made permissible some of what you made permissible? And what made impermissible some of what you made impermissible? Is it your opinion that if somebody says, ask for the mosque, Indeed, I find it more valuable as an inheritance. And as for the endowment in which profit was for the poor, indeed, I allow it. Because the reports coming about it are vast, so I permit what came about it in the reports and make the mosque impermissible as well as its profitability as inheritance. He gives it to his friend to sell it because no report about it came like what came regarding the endowment in regards to what we are saying. I do not know who said this, except that it was acceptable as a proof from you. Because he made the ratio legis, the erla, of the endowment from reports. And he made a ratio legis of the graveyard from disentombing the dead. I do not know for you an erla, ratio legis, you can use for the masjid, mosque. One should not arbitrarily rule yet tahakkamu for the people, but we have found reports regarding endowments upon what we have described to you. So we analogize based on them what is like them. Because the reports are not coming regard, regarding everything, but come regarding some. So what did not come in a report is analogized by what came having reports. So, in view of that, it is our opinion that the endowment left possession of its owner, just like its profits were, paced, were placed for the mendicant poor and travelers as came in the report. So, likewise, we put what is similar, ma'ashbaha, of it that is like it, mithluhu. In other words, we put the mosque in the same position of the endowments that none of the endowments or the mosque can be repossessed. So we said, when he places the land as a mosque for the Muslims, then it is at this position. So we made an analogy of the mosque, and there did not come reports about it by means of the endowment, which has a lot of reports. So you based your ruling upon what you did not have a report from the Prophet, nor upon one of the companions, so you made it permissible. And you based your ruling and what came in reports about the mosque and thus made it abolished by a proof you put forth from the possession that you had already made permissible like it. So we said to him also, when the man made his land for the Muslims as a hostel and built for it wayfarers to dwell in or put it as a graveyard for the Muslims or as a watering hole for them or as a lodging for the pilgrimage or warriors in the path of God 
then all of this is getting close to God the exalted, like how one gets close to God via an endowment. Analogy, qiyas, of all of them is one. So all of these things, according to the detractor's logic, should be permissible. As for somebody who says, I abolish all of these things and the profit from them, you know, returning them goes to the owner. So if he wishes to sell, gift, or dies, leaving it as inheritance, accept the mosque exclusively because it did not transfer to another owner and it is not being an inheritance if the owner dies, is not acceptable for his friend to sell it or give it. Therefore, he should not sell, gift, bequeath it, as was said. How do these people arbitrarily judge at tahakkamu upon people with this arbitrary education? The people do not take the saying of Abu Hanifa and his students, ashabihi, except just to leave them by these detractors arbitrary education upon the people? So when was there those who arbitrarily adjudicated upon the people by a non-report, غير أثر, and without analogy that they did not accept from a figure of authority, لم يقلد, لم يقلدو, regarding these things. If we accepted from a figure of authority regarding these things alone, then it was in the past before Abu Hanifa, such as Al-Hassan al-Basri, and Ibrahim al nakhai or the likes of them, more worthy to be accepted as a figure of authority. So he should not arbitrarily adjudicate upon the people. If the things were done by one example, it would be said regarding the one saying, except if it comes from a report of the messenger of God, or from one of his companions. So then he compiles to that. So as for when it was what is said about using opinion, bil ra'i, nullifies the arbitrary adjudication, batala al tahakkuma, then he did not differentiate, yufarriqu, between the concurred upon, mujtama'a, nor did he concur between the differentiated things. End quote. So I know that was a lot to digest. Um, it's quite a lot of information that uh, Muhammad al-Shaybani, I mean, has just given us there epistemologically, epistemically. Um, I mean, it's clear that you have, you know, uh, the prophet as being the strongest type of hadith. Or evidence you know something from the prophet is better then you have the companions and then you have like the tabi'in or the salaf like Hassan al-Basri Ibrahim al nakhai you know that demarcation was there from the very beginning from the first extant legal text Kitab al-Asl and you can see here that there is a clear epistemology about how Qiyas is supposed to work the word Allah is there you know what's the reason behind uh, a certain ruling so we see from very on in Islamic legal history that uh, there is a, an epistemology there there is a legal reasoning that's happening it's it's not this kind of simplistic vacuous arbitrary kind of uh, system like Joseph Schacht tries to insinuate in his book, you know, the origins of Mohammedan jurisprudence. I mean, had he looked at Kitab al-Asl, I think he would have a very different opinion. And that's the problem with, you know, al-Mustashraqeen, the, you know, with the Orientalists, is, uh, you know, this, uh, they call it revisionism too, uh, you know, this type of revisionist, you know, historical methodology where we want to go against a lot of the narrative that we find in historical sources, go against what the hadith say, go against what uh, Sira says in, you know, traditional Muslim historiography. Uh, you know, you're kind of, I feel like he's kind of pulling at straws. You know, we there's clear evidence in Kitab al-Asl that there was some type of legal epistemology or legal theory 
some type of usul fiqh as we know it nowadays. And so Shaybani explains in the beginning of the chapter how he believes that when a piece of land is donated as an endowment, that it, is there, that it therefore transfers to the command of God when it is under the caretaker's supervision. His detractors, Amma Ashabina, who appear to be Hanafis, or at the very least other people from the Ahl Ra'i camp, posit that indeed the property never left its owner's possession, and therefore he can repossess his property whenever he likes to gift it, sell it, and bequeath it as he pleases. They base this off analogy, but arbitrarily say it is not permissible to repossess an endowment if it is a mosque, likely using istihsan, you know, seeking the greater good, or maslaha. But Shaybani accuses them, accuses them of being logically inconsistent. He basically says there is no greater good in keeping the mosque when people have many places to pray and will simply find another mosque to pray at. So preventing somebody to retract it doesn't even make logical sense according to their logic, the detractor's logic. Whereas they allow somebody to repossess, to repossess a graveyard they donated as an endowment and extract the dead to dig irrigation and the likes, which is obviously harmful and taboo for society. So even for the greater good argument does not work. The maslaha, the istihsan, he's saying their istihsan is faulty. Moreover, if they're going to use analogy to say they can repossess other types of endowments, then they also have to be logically consistent and apply that to the mosque so that the mosque may be repossessed. More simply, Shaybani is accusing his detractors of not being able to properly utilize qiyas or istihsan and are totally logically inconsistent. So, I mean, for me, this is clear evidence that Shaybani had a legal, epistemo a legal epistemology formulated out. He could show you how people were being inconsistent in applying legal methodology and he had an idea of what it was supposed to look like and what it wasn't supposed to look like. It was demarcated. So Shaybani is of the opinion that all types of donated endowments cannot be repossessed despite the fact the owner does not change because it is under the command of God, like what came in a report where the prophet said to his companion Omar, give charity by means of a land which in its essence cannot be sold, gifted, nor bequeathed, but is to benefit by means of its fruits. That's a hadith that is in this chapter in Kitab al-Asl. So you could find it in uh, volume 12, uh, page 96. And if you, if you request, I can... Uh, you know, I wrote this out as a paper for graduate school. You know, you can shoot me an email. My email's here on my YouTube channel in the About section. Shoot me an email, and I can send this to you. Although Kitab al-Asl does not explicitly always state what epistemology lies beneath the surface or what hermeneutical method is being applied, it can still be teased out with a careful eye. Ronald L. Grimes... Uh, professor of religious studies, says, whereas scholars conceptualize local variations by using ethnographic methods to study ritual performance. They use theories variously labeled as cognitive, etheological, physiological, evolutionary, biogenetic, and neurobiological to study ritual competence. Borrowing the performance competence distinction from linguistics some scholars use the term performance to designate the way people actually speak and the term competence to denote the rules implied by their speech. Performance is what people do. Competence is what facilitates and shapes what they do. Performance appears on the surface and is cultural, culturally malleable. 
competence lurks below the surface and is not so malleable, end quote. Ritual competence is like the grammar of languages, and most of us can speak before we are able to articulate any underlying grammar behind our speech. In fact, most native speakers of a language have an extremely difficult time explaining how grammar rules work in their language unless they have explicitly studied them. In fact, one can become extremely articulate what could become extremely articulate and grow a very large lexicon without knowing any grammar consciously. All of us who use language have a subconscious understanding of its grammar. For that you can uh, look at the theories of Jacques Lacan. You know, the unconscious is structured like language. Ritual performance can be observed, but the competence behind the ritual, or law, can often be difficult to decipher unless explicitly mentioned, but it is not impossible. Thomas Lawson and Robert Macaulay both study the ritual competence in the mind of an idealized participant. And likewise, we are looking above at idealized notions of ritual law, articulated by a people of late antiquity, early medieval period, from over a thousand years ago. Referring to such epistemologies as we, as we have studied above, Thomas Lawson and Robert Macaulay say it employs a finite system of rules which can account for an indefinitely large number of representations and thereby explains the competence of participants to have systematic intuitions and insights into a wide range of features of both actual and possible religious rituals, including ones they have never ever encountered. In short, it explains both participants' competence and their creativity with their ritual system." End quote. In other words, you have a legal theory, usul fiqh, this legal epistemology, and from this epistemology can come a plethora of different rituals. You can apply it in many different ways and on many different situations. Islamic legal theory is such a system that has the ability to generate infinite outcomes and also has the ability for itself to change infinitely. In Islamic law, authority, which is at once religious and moral, but mostly epistemic in nature, has always encompassed the power to set in motion the inherent processes of continuity and change. Therefore, genealogies of epistemic changes in Islamic legal theory can be very enlightening to the diversity of thought that humanity is capable of and is influenced by its socio-political historical context. Islamic law in particular is the product of a scholarly class of ritual experts called fuqaha. In other words, this ritual law system we call Islamic legal theory was not created by the Umayyad or Abbasid caliphs, but rather it was the product of a scholarly class of jurisprudence. These rituals and or laws were not primarily tools of the polity, but were intellectual output from religious scholars deriving from the Qur'an, Sunnah, and other various forms of legal reasoning. And these sources of authority bound the caliph just as much as his people. These intellectual endeavors of the fuqaha, as we saw above, are complex, legalistic, and esoteric. Piri says regarding the law as scholarship. In his book, The Anthropology of Law, he says, the task of creating rules for and giving meaning to the activities of daily life was a matter of jurisprudence, then more than codification, and produced an esoteric body of scholarship that it was the task of experts, the jurists, Brahmins, and Muftis, to explain for the layman or the judge. This was not just an academic exercise, and the work of these scholars was respected and regarded as authoritative in many different ways. What does this mean for the study of law? It suggests that we should look for law in the activities of scholars as well as those of judges and rulers. And it, conforms, it confirms that in order to understand law, even as an empirical matter, we may need to engage in the study of jurisprudence and its interpretive techniques." End quote. 
part of studying law is also studying its underlying ways of reasoning or the epistemologies of law. This can only be found via texts or statements of the scholarly class of legists or legists. They posit an ideal model of how the world can and should be. Then they articulate, articulate the rituals and rules from their underpinning legal epistemology. This brings to the foray principles of legal thought that may not, that may not be those of the pragmatic proclivities of the judge serving in courts. Indeed, within Islamic typology, there is an intellectual hierarchy of qualifications where a judge would be a muqallid, the lowest of rungs on the intellectual ladder, and the juris consult, mufti, at the apex. Despite the fuqaha of more than a thousand years ago being enigmatic figures due to the lack of extant texts and often polemical nature of sources of history, we could still try our best as academics to trace a genealogy of thought from their remaining texts. I am humbly hoping that in my translations, just given above here, and analysis of the secondary literature that perhaps I have aided in demonstrating how the early Muslim jurists of the Ahl al-Ra'i, how their, their, that movement of thought transmuted into the system purported by the Hanafi founding fathers. We cannot know what ritual law means, does, or is without first understanding its epistemological underpinnings and hermeneutics, as well as the socio-political context. And we should look at how religious legal reasoning can in turn influence later generations and other religions. In early Islamic legal thought, there were competing notions of what constituted prophetic sunnah, as we talked about earlier. One camp saying that it was hadith text, whereas others postulated it was their local practice. Many polemical legal writings against the Ahl Ra'i must be analyzed with scrutiny, since likely they have tacit theological underpinnings, as we mentioned before in the video on theology. The early Hanafis emerged most prominently from the Ahl Ra'i camp. One of Abu Hanifa's main students, Shebani, has a 12-volume work, some of which we have seen. As we saw, Shaybani marks an epistemological shift from Abu Hanifa via accepting more hadiths, particularizing the general much more than Abu Hanifa. Kitab al-Asl in every chapter gives the Asl, basis, for various legal rulings found therein, and sometimes an explicit legal epistemology. Shaybani likely had a large influence on Shafi'i, perhaps particularly inspiring Kitab al-Risala particularization, shift towards reliance on hadith, and explications of the underpinning epistemology behind his rulings were major themes we saw in Kitab al-Asl from Shaybani. Kitab al-Asl showed a more system systemic and rigorous legal epistemology in early Hanafism than shown by current scholarship. There are straightforward ideas regarding Qiyas and Istihsan which confirm Halaq's thesis about early Qiyas and Istihsan, while Halaq, as we talked about before. There, there are many hadiths in Kitab al-Asl which are found in later canonical hadith collections, thus showing earlier historical evidence of their usage. Hanafis did actually use hadith literature quite extensively. Kitab al-Asl is the greatest historical source on Abu Hanifa, confirming current scholarship on his legal thought his reliance on local Kufin praxis, and preferring the general, more certain sources over the particular from weaker sources was evinced in Kitab al-Asl. Given the above study that I just gave, I would implore our academics interested in early Islamic law to investigate Kitab al-Asl, as well as other neglected texts from Muhammad al-Hassan al-Shaybani, such as al-Jami' al-Saghir and al-Jami' al-Kabir. Shaybani's works are an important historical witness to their time. And I want to end this video uh, by letting you know that it may be a little while before I make another video on the history of the Hanafi Medhab, but I'm not going to neglect this series or forget about it. I'm just going to do some further research and reading, and I'm going to talk about how the Hanafi kind of developed more in the mid-medieval period 
after um, Muhammad Shaybani, you have figures like Ibn Aban, you have figures like Imam al tahawi al marghinani author of Al-Hidayah, you have uh, the author of, uh, you know, you got Mukhtasar al-Quduri, you know, Imam Quduri, and a lot of, uh, you know, these texts that came out in the mid-medieval period that I want to look into, um, talk a little bit about how Hanafism spread around the world. How did Hanafism come to Central Asia? How did Hanafism come to China? How is it different in China than other places? How is Hanafism different in South Asia, the Indian subcontinent, than other places? Because the Dioband and Bravli, uh, movements, they, Bravli movements, they are, they have their own interpretation of Hanafism that differs from the Arabs in many ways. You know, uh, one example is the beard. Um, you know, Hanafis in the Indian subcontinent are very strict about the beard. And they are not in Arab countries. They also have different ideas about uh, what constitutes halal food. And the Arab Hanafis disagree a lot of times with the, the Asian Hanafis, the subcontinent Hanafis. And also the Central Asian tradition morphed into the Ottoman tradition. And so that's also an important development. We can talk about how the Ottomans uh, codified or attempted to codify the Hanafi Madhab with, with what they called the al Um And we can also talk about how the Arabs tried to resist, the Arab Hanafis tried to resist this codification by the Ottomans. So those are some topics that I'm, I'm looking forward to getting at. And also talk about you know, a lot of the major Hanafi scholars. You know, the country of Somalia at one time was predominantly Hanafi and, and later the Shafi'i Madhab became dominant there. Uh, there's always been a long history of Hanafis in Iraq, of course, in Egypt, in uh, Qairawan, in Tunisia, and uh, various places around the globe. You know, the Hanafi Madhab today is largest numerically, um, has the most followers, the most scholars who write about it, and that type of thing. So it's kind of uh, the elephant in the room, so to say. Uh, most Muslims are Hanafi. That's just plainly a fact. And therefore, it's imperative to understand uh, Hanafi legal history and how it influences Islamic civilization. And we can also take a look at a lot of the major Hanafi texts that are taught today and that have been taught in the past. I think that'll be uh, very uh, fun and interesting. And with that, I'll end the video. Ma'asalama. Subscribe. Like it. Thanks for watching.